Hello, everybody, and a warm welcome to a chilly night here in Sydney to the Institute of International Affairs. Our topic tonight is the situation arising with Northern Ireland and its relations with Britain and the European Union as Brexit begins to kick in. Our speaker tonight, Dr. Dermot Maguire, spoke to us last in 2017 when the consequences of Brexit were just beginning to be felt. Sadly, over the past couple of weeks, those consequences have begun to be very complicated and indeed very sad with the redevelopment of community violence in Northern Ireland. We are fortunate to have such an expert as Dr. Maguire to speak to us tonight. He's had long-standing research interests at the University of Sydney in European and international politics, social movements, and in particular, the relationship between protest movements and state authorities in the ethnically divided societies of Israel and Palestine and Northern Ireland. And in addition to all of that, Dr. Maguire is himself Irish. Over to you, Dr. Maguire. Okay, thank you very much. Well, this year marks the 100th anniversary of Northern Ireland and its uneasy and violent establishment within the modern United Kingdom. The partition of Northern Ireland was based on the initial uh, sectarian equation of 65% Protestant, which was unionist, and 35% Catholic, which was nationalist. This year has also seen the UK finally leave the European Union with both parties, that is the EU and the UK, uh, agreeing to the Northern Ireland Protocol, which I'll be outlining in more detail later on. But the intention of this protocol was essentially to safeguard uh, the peace agreement or the Good Friday Agreement, which was arrived at in 1998. Now, under the Good Friday Agreement, the European Union provided uh, economic peace while paramilitaries disarmed and state forces withdrew. For the first time since 1921, Northern Ireland gained widespread legitimacy. The role of the US in facilitating this deal was absolutely central to this outcome. And the mechanism for arriving at this uh, agreement was remarkable for the enormous architecture that was wielded at the domestic level, at the supranational level, and at the international level. It involved the US, it involved the EU, involved the British and Irish governments. And together, they all got together and created a means by which violent politics could be eliminated within Northern Ireland. With Brexit, these relationships, as we've seen recently at the G7, have become under great strain. And Northern Ireland remains stubbornly central. So although there are a number of problems with the Good Friday Agreement, which I won't go into, there are no, no denying its effect. To put it in green statistics, between 1968 and 1998, the year of the peace agreement, over 3,700 uh, people were killed in Northern Ireland as a result of the conflict. From 1998 to 2019, 154 people have been killed in that conflict. The border between the North and the South of Ireland has been physically unpatrolled and rendered invisible as a result of that agreement. This allowed citizens in the North, if you like, to forget, to forget about borders, which had previously led to violence. 
economic links between the North and the South grew stronger. Human rights, equality rights were guaranteed as a result of membership of the European Union. So the results of the Brexit referendum in 2016 endangered the Good Friday referendum. Brexit essentially re-established borders. Southern Ireland is still a member of the EU while the UK has withdrawn. Therefore, this sets up a border between the UK and the EU, but also potentially within Ireland itself, between the North and the South. Therefore, I will argue that the results of these two referendums are effectively incompatible. And let me outline this in more detail. First of all, Brexit reminds citizens of Northern Ireland of the existence of borders, whether it is a border on land or a border at sea. Border on land is between the North, Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland. A border at sea is between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. Nationalists will be upset by the reintroduction of a land border. Unionists will be upset by the establishment of a sea border. Second, Brexit brings to the fore all the quiet work done by the EU that by the EU and it makes the EU now an active player in a game that has been constructed essentially by the British government. Under the Good Friday Agreement, the EU dispensed grants that brought together opposing parties. It provided support for border areas that were once sites of conflict, and it supported non-sectarian civic groups. Now the British government actively portrays the EU as being an enemy of peace in Northern Ireland. Third, Brexit brings back again the US, who have not only spent considerable political capital on the Good Friday Agreement, they also have a, 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 a president who is clearly committed to it. President Biden believes in the Northern Ireland, North, Northern Irish Protocol, and he stated, quote, it is critical to ensuring that the spirit, promise, and future of the Good Friday Agreement is protected. Fourth, Brexit now poses an existential threat to Northern Ireland. In the Good Friday Agreement, the Northern Irish could vote in a referendum about the future existence of that province. With demographic trends favoring the Catholic population, but also with Brexit, unions see this as a threat. By voting to leave the United Kingdom and join the Republic of Ireland, Northern Irish citizens will also be voting to join the European Union. I'll go into that in more detail later on. So here Brexit, as it ferments a crisis within unionism and threatens the relative stability of Northern Irish politics, the organization of the border between uh, Ireland, uh, which is in the EU, and Northern Ireland, which part of Brexit, has now become important, not only in terms of trade, but it also, as I say, poses an existential crisis for this province. For the first time in 23 years, sectarian violence has returned to the streets. Meanwhile, the 
British government has worsened its relationship with the EU and the US because of its inability to reconcile Brexit with the Good Friday Agreement. Let's go back and look at a bit of history. First of all, the Brexit referendum, which was called by David Cameron as a means essentially to fix internal divisions within the Conservative Party and to ward off th threats from uh, UTKIP, he, did, he had no consideration basically for the Good Friday Agreement. The consequence for the Good Friday Agreement, the Good Friday Agreement did not enter into his calculations. And once the results were known, he basically uh, retired and handed this on to his successor. Theresa May still had to deal with the Conservative Party in crisis, torn between Remainers and no dealers. She called an election, it was a minority government, and they relied on Northern Ireland's Democratic Unionist Party, the DUP, for support. The DUP did not support one of Theresa May's four attempts to reconcile the Good Friday Agreement with Brexit. Her solution was for no hard border to be created between the North and the South of Ireland. This will be handled by allowing a backstop, which is essentially an insurance policy of EU rules and regulations governing the movement of goods until a free trade agreement was worked out. Theresa May, Theresa May's government warned the DUP that if Boris Johnson came to power, he would sell them out. Theresa May was nonetheless ignored by the DUP. They voted down her attempt at a deal down. All of Theresa May's attempts to reconcile of the Good Friday Agreement and Brexit failed. And in 2019, Boris Johnson was installed as prime minister. Now his attempt to deliver to the electorate an oven ready uh, Brexit deal resulted in the Northern Ireland Protocol. This protocol recognized the special status of Northern Ireland within an all Ireland economy, but especially its relationship with the Good Friday Agreement. Right at the beginning of that protocol, it states, I've read it, uh, it exists to safeguard the advances made under the Good Friday Agreement. That's the reason why this, this protocol exists. The decision was made to make Northern Ireland subject to the rules and regulations of the EU to continue to allow free travel within the island. Instead, a stay border was established with Britain, whereby any goods of British origin entering into Northern Ireland would have to be checked by EU inspectors. It states on the UK government website, as a, res quote, as a result of this protocol, Northern Ireland has in effect remained in the EU's single market for goods. England, Scotland and Wales have left the EU's single market for goods. This was the way they basically sought to safeguard the Good Friday Agreement. This avoided also the creation of the land border between Northern and Southern Ireland. As predicted by Theresa May, the creation of a sea border between Northern Ireland and Great Britain deprived unionists at least in their mind, of contact with mainland Britain. 
some unionists took to the streets and engaged in violence against the police service of Northern Ireland. Some unionists threw petrol bombs into certain areas dominated by nationalists. Meanwhile, the British government played a very dangerous game that has not gone unnoticed in either Washington or Brussels. The British government seeks to portray the Northern Irish Protocol, which it had signed and dreamt up in the first place, as unworkable. It regards the best way to do this is by encouraging unionist discontent in Northern Ireland. And the Daily Telegraph recently led with a headline that quoted the Brexit negotiator, Lord Frost, saying, quote, the EU risks undermining the Northern Irish peace process. Now, looking at the G7 last week, leading into that, President Biden issued a very rare démarche or formal diplomatic warning about the British government's inflammatory rhetoric. President Biden also stated that a trade agreement between the US and the UK would be more likely if Britain safeguarded the Good Friday Agreement. There's the carrot that he offered to them. Before attending the G7, President Macron announced that the EU would not back down over the Northern Ireland Protocol and stated that nothing is negotiable. And President Biden made it very clear that the European Union was central to US European politics. Prime Minister Johnson's attempts to utilize the G7 to launch global Britain was constantly marred by Brexit and the Northern Ireland Protocol in particular. And frustrated by these events, Johnson called on EU leaders to be more flexible and less purist. Less purist. That was the ministerial line. Johnson threatened that if it did not, then the British government was prepared to break the Northern Irish Protocol. EU leaders have to recognize, he said, that the UK, including Northern Ireland, is a sovereign entity. Again, let's remember the Good Friday Agreement left the status of Northern Ireland in a deliberately ambiguous manner. All island meetings were held between the Irish government and the British government and the devolved parliament of Northern Ireland. Uh, citizens of the North could either carry British or Irish passports. There were free passage of people between North and South of Ireland and between Ireland and the UK. Yes, Northern Ireland was still formally a part of the UK. However, this agreement used creative ambiguity around borders to allow nationalists and unionists to live side by side. So for Johnson to state that, uh, to emphasize UK state sovereignty over Northern Ireland, uh, as he did recently at the, at the G7 is not in the spirit of that agreement. It should also be noted that the Good Friday Agreement of 1998 is part of international law. It was signed by both the UK and Irish government when both were members of the EU. It means that UK governance of Northern Ireland is not the same as other parts of Britain. Governance of Northern Ireland demands, first of all, complex negotiations with uh, the Southern Irish government. It demands dealing with the European Union. Thirdly, it demands managing an ambiguous border. Fourthly, handling a, a, a devolved assembly. Fifthly, dealing with a power sharing executive that has got more powers than either Scotland or Wales. And sixthly, operating within a different and unique legal framework. 
So all of these things make managing and dealing with, uh, with Northern Ireland uh, very different, as I say, uh, than other parts of Britain. And the way in which that has been established has been established as a result of international law. In April this year, a number of unionist paramilitaries announced that they were they had the intent they announced their intention to formally withdraw from the Good Friday Agreement as a result of the Northern Irish Protocol. This did not mean they were taking up arms, but it was an important signal to the British government. They regarded the Northern Irish Protocol not only as cutting them off from Britain, but they argued that affected the effective membership of the customs union pushed Northern Ireland towards Southern Ireland economically and therefore politically. Unionist rioters took soon trip to the streets. So even though all we're really talking about is goods from Britain being checked at Northern Irish ports, this was enough to spark off this sort of violence and reaction. Of course, there are some unionists who never supported the Good Friday Agreement, and they saw the Northern Ireland Protocol as an opportunity to deal with their true grievances. Unionists have always been suspicious of the EU. They've always been suspicious of the US, obviously the Irish government, but deep within their DNA, is a fundamental distrust of the British government to whom they claim allegiance. They have uh, the suspicion, which is justified, uh, that the British government would dearly love to get rid of them. And in 1998, when the Food Friday Agreement was being, uh, when it was, when there's a referendum held on it, the DUP uh, campaigned against it. So what would it mean if Britain followed through on its threat and overturned the Northern Ireland, Northern Irish Protocol? After all, it contains essential safeguards for the Good Friday Agreement. Could this move mean overturning the Good Friday Agreement itself? The, there would be no, there's no other safeguards in existence. This was the message that EU leaders tried to get across during the G7. This was the message that uh, President Biden sought to emphasize to the British Prime Minister at the G7. And it is the clarion call of some uh, unionist protesters who would dearly love to see the end of the Good Friday Agreement altogether. Now, within uh, Northern Ireland, demographically speaking, there are now more Catholics than Protestants. In the 2011 census, there were 48% Protestants to 45% Catholics. Remember, said, said at the beginning, the founding of the state, there were 65% uh, Protestants to 35% Catholics. The 2021 census will show for the very first time a Catholic majority within the North. And as stated, every citizen has a right to vote on a referendum on a united Ireland, according to the Good Friday Agreement. Pre-Brexit, this didn't create great change as a significant number of Catholics were happy with the current situation. However, with Brexit, their economic situation has worsened 
And if there's violence, it, there may well be their political situation as well. This may make Irish unity, this makes Irish unity, but more importantly, renewed membership of the EU more attractive. And a minority of largely middle-class Protestants also entertain this idea. So the possible expulsion, and, and this possible expulsion from the EU was one of the strongest weapons that was used by Prime Minister David Cameron in his successful bid to stop the Scottish voting for independence in the 2014 referendum before uh, Britain had voted for Brexit in 2016. So while a, for a future independent Scotland, should it exist, would have to apply to join the EU, no such barrier would exist for Irish nationalists. As soon as the Brexit results were known in 2016, Sinn Féin called for a border poll. Sinn Féin welcomed this additional uh, weapon of membership of the EU into its arsenal, if you like. And according to recent opinion polls, Sinn Féin is ahead of other parties in the south of Ireland by 10 points. Sinn Féin currently has 34% of the vote. It is also, according to, uh, uh, according to opinion polls, the leading party within the north of Ireland. Now, again, I would argue on the basis of past polls, this is, this is, uh, a, you, this is something that's basic, uh, obviously unprovable, but that nationalists would not have voted in sufficient numbers for a united Ireland. But let's, let's note what happened in the past. In 2011, according to one poll, 52% of Catholics, supposedly nationalists, favored remaining within the UK, that is pre-Brexit. Now that figure has gone down to 20% post-Brexit. So this is another worry for unionists in the long term. Also many unionists question past strategy of the DUP to preserve the union. Putting faith in the Tory party and Boris Johnson in particular has been seen as a crucial mistake. This partly explains the recent dramatic collapse of the DUP itself into various factions, the toppling of its leader, and the subsequent purge of, uh, of its softliners within uh, DUP ministers. D many DUP members have moved on to other parties. Many have joined the moderate Alliance Party, which has now moved up to second place in the opinion polls, but hardline uh, unionist parties are also picking up on the vote. Meanwhile, the annual unionist marching season, that of the Orange Order, is just around the corner, that is July and August. In other words, these will be the tensest months that uh, Northern Ireland will enter into. So, although no, no two events are ever the same in history, there is a whiff of 1969 in the air. In 1969, the Unionist Party was divided for the first time into moderates who formed the, Demo the, the dominant faction, but there were hardline followers of the Reverend Ian Paisley. The Northern Ireland, Northern Irish Labour Party also took a significant share of the unionist vote. The IRA didn't exist as an armed group to all extents and purposes. 
nationalist demonstrators at this stage. I run, they, they marched together and they ironically demanded British rights for British citizens. Meanwhile, Westminster was asleep at the wheel. This was uh, the situation in which uh, the troubles developed and it lasted for 30 years until the Good Friday Agreement. Now, hopefully this time, unionist divisions don't result, don't result in violent conflict with nationalists, although they usually do. However, this time, there are three things going against this. There are entities paying close attention at the international and, and supranational level, that is the EU and the US. Secondly, the Good Friday Agreement is also recognized in international law. And thirdly, the uh, mechanisms ex exist within the Northern Ireland state itself, such as the Northern Ireland office, which, and this is the civil service of not only the Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland Irish Assembly, but also of the Good Friday Agreement itself. Now, all of these factors may not be enough to prevent violence taking place on the streets and paramilitaries may well take up arms again. But if something like the past does occur, then three things must be regarded as causal. First, the decision to set in motion the Brexit referendum without any thought as to the consequences if passed, despite all the warnings that were uh, launched by former politicians like Tony Blair. Second, the British government's handling of the chain of events that have been set off by Brexit since 19, uh, since, <laughs> since uh, 2016. And third, Brexit's structural contradiction with the Good Friday Agreement. There may be lots of noise trying to stress other causal factors. Talk about sausages wars or uh, Northern Irish teenagers suddenly becoming delinquent. However, I argue that these three factors are central to a violent situation that I hope does not occur. Thank you very much, Dermot. Dr. Maguire is now happy to take questions and have discussions for, for the next uh, half hour. So whether you're here in the hall or whether you're listening to us on Zoom, where you'll be using your Q&A function, please don't hesitate to put something to us. We have a question online. Uh, this question is from um, Shi Wong. I would like to ask Dr. Maguire regarding potential outcomes of Yep. I would like to ask Dr. Maguire regarding potential outcomes of the independence, um, willingness and elections of Scotland and Northern Ireland. Even if Scotland and Northern Ireland citizens respectively choose to quit the UK by vote, as long as the British government does not acknowledge the potential votes, would Scotland and Northern Ireland still be able to successfully be independent from the UK anyway? I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Basically, question if I can summarize it is can uh, if 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 they if both are allowed uh, to have referendums uh yes they can um and in, in, um, in, according to the Good Friday Agreement, it states somewhat, uh, it's, a, it's a bit difficult to sort of uh, work out how, how this is to happen, but there's a trigger that gets set 
that uh, basically will indicate to the Secretary of State for Northern Ireland that uh, there may be a majority in favour of a united Ireland. And in order to test that, he will hold a referendum. So the trigger might be, for example, this year's uh, census may serve, oh, there's a majority of Catholics. Maybe I'll hold a referendum now. But it doesn't state exactly what that particular, what those particular triggers are. Or it may be that the, there's a whole series of opinion polls that come in again and again that indicate that there's a majority in favor of a united Ireland. And therefore he says, okay, let's test this. Um, within Scotland, uh, obviously the, the, Nicola Sturgeon, she's constantly calling for, uh, you know, let's have a, let's have a vote now. Uh, there's an attempt by Boris Johnson to hold back on that. But uh, once they have a referendum and once they're able to vote in that, yeah, they can vote themselves out, no problem. Do we have a question here in the room? Yeah, please, Chris. Thank you very much. Within England, uh, in the opposition, uh, Labour Party, do they have any other alternatives? Is there pushback or any strong opposition to what the Conservatives are doing right now? Thank you. Uh, it, yeah. It's it, the the uh, the uh, the head of the uh, the British Labour Party has, has basically backed uh, the British Prime Minister in his calls against the uh, EU and stated that the EU needs to sort of loosen up in terms of its push around the. Uh, Northern Irish Protocol and things like that. Anything, it, it, yeah, it's it's just unbelievable. Uh, so there's no there's no real um, opposition, let's say, within Britain. I just read about this this morning. I thought this is a great chance for Labour to have it uh, to take a take a, a, a stance within opposition. Blah 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 to carve out some space for itself. Blah blah blah. No, they're frightened. Um, so no. Question online. So this question is from Jocelyn, and it's I note in the um, Jocelyn. So I note in press commentary on the G7 meeting that some of the EU members do not accept that Northern Ireland is part of the UK. How widespread is this view? Yeah, that's that's uh, actually English papers say that. <laughs> what th there's a what what was said at the at the um, in uh, the meeting with between Macron and the uh, British Prime Minister was they did not accept that that the UK was a country. They regarded the UK as a union of four different countries, and the uh, Boris Johnson came out and said, "Oh, so the, you're you're arguing then that uh, Northern Ireland isn't part of the UK?" Blah blah blah, and then everybody started piling on in terms of that particular. So it was just a big pile on in terms of the way in which they, they used uh, they used this. Yeah. Thank you. Next question. Yes, we have one online. This question is from A. Gallagher, um, and it's, what is behind the rise of Catholics to become the majority in the North? Well, there's one obvious thing. This is that, <laughs> but uh, apart from the obvious, uh, Catholics in the past, when they had their 
largish families, they were, let's say, encouraged to leave as a result of the discrimination that existed within the north of Ireland. So even though it looked as if, you know, the Catholics were going to, as my father said, outbreed uh, the Protestants, there was always this uh, escape valve that Protestants had where there was no work that uh, Catholics were able to find. And therefore Catholics uh, went to Britain, they went well, you know, to other countries in order to seek work. With the Green Friday Agreement, this basically gar guaranteed human rights, it guaranteed equality rights, et cetera, et cetera. So more and more uh, Catholics basically stayed uh, on the spot, so to speak. And so that explains uh, essentially uh, why it is that, that Catholics are more likely to, to stay on. That makes me wonder about Northern Irish Protestants who, who have often left Northern Ireland, many of them to Australia. Are they showing any tendency in this current circumstance to go to Britain or elsewhere? No, not well, we, we haven't seen, I, I don't, I really don't know, but um, I mean, the, um, what we've certainly seen is that um, among certain politicians, they've talked about um, Protestants leaving Northern Ireland in a peaceful manner if it becomes part of a united Ireland. Um, some Protestants will say they'll, you know, they'll fight to the to the bitter end. Um, but nonetheless, I, I don't think there's a uh, there's an outflow, necessarily a big outflow of Protestants in the in as as a result of immigration or anything like that. Thanks. Next question. From Tim Purcell, given the situation you've outlined, it may be possible for um, Northern Ireland to re-enter the EU. Would that also mean all the previous conditions of the EU would apply freedom of movement and employment? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Everything would apply. Everything would apply. Northern Ireland would go back to the, uh, to, uh, it would have all the rights that it previously enjoyed as a member of the, of the EU. Yeah. Fascinating. Would Scotland be far behind? Well, I think Scotland is more likely to uh, have, to have independence than uh, Northern Ireland at the moment. Enjoy. And the, the opinion polls demonstrate something like uh, 60, uh, See the, the difference, I mean, it depends which particular polls you're looking at, but the opinion polls on Scotland are fairly neck and neck in terms of uh, independence, you know, staying within the EU. In Northern Ireland, it's still a long way off. I mean, we're talking about something 10 to 15 years off in terms of independence or anything like that. Next question online. From Rowena, do you have any comments on the politics of the Republic in relation to Northern Ireland? Well, I mean, the, the Republic is, I mean, the Republic has suffered as a result of Brexit. We must recognize that a lot of the uh, Republic, uh, a lot of the Republic's uh, exports went to Britain as well as to uh, as, as to other parts of, uh, of Europe. So the Republic has seen a net drop in terms of uh, its exports to Britain. So it's, 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 it's suffered as a result of that. Nonetheless, the Republic of Ireland has built a number of ferries, which are very interesting uh, in Los Lair, for example, that goes from Los Ross Lair all the way to Dunkirk, uh, they're showing the Dunkirk spirit. And this is the way in which uh, Irish freight is able to avoid going through Britain. Because if you go through Britain, then you're stuck in Kent and you have to go through 
all these checks and so on and so forth. Ireland has now sought this way of getting around Britain. It's got direct links with the continent. And this is something that is excites the uh, Irish government. There's also links between Dublin and, uh, uh, and, and France as well in terms of ferry transport. So although these things may not be as politically exciting or whatever in terms of uh, things that, that happen, nonetheless, these, these links that are being established nonetheless see that Britain is more or less being put to the one side and, uh, and, and, and Ireland is able to develop uh, another way to get through uh, to, uh, to its, its market within, uh, within Europe. We seem to have a good long list of questions. What's the next slide? From Matthew Coote. How much influence do leading religious figures have in Northern Ireland these days? Are they peacemakers? or are they more likely to stir up trouble as some did in the past? I think they're, they're largely peacemakers. I mean, religious people are largely peacemakers. I mean, religious people, it was a, it was a uh, Catholic priest who largely was responsible for the uh, IRA laying down its arms, um, went back and forth between uh, the Jerry Adams and uh, Martin McGuinness and the British government and you know MI5 and all the rest of it and got them together, um, but also within uh, you know within the uh, Protestant religions, uh, you find a similar sort of uh, stance being taken by uh, various various people there who, who, who are leaders. So I, I largely see the, the leaders of those religions as being uh, essentially peaceful rather than as, as, you know, stirring up trouble. It's basically people who like interpret uh, the religion and fight on behalf of the religion and march on behalf of a religion that they only half understand. Um, like a lot of people, for example, on both sides are right there marching and they probably haven't attended a service on one side or another for, you know, the past year or so. Uh, but nonetheless, they march on behalf of the Catholics or the Protestants. But the real, the re the real thinkers, uh, that is the Catholic priests, uh, Protestant figures, things like that, these are people, these are serious people who have thought about peace. From Patrick, thanks very much for your presentation. We think of the situation as a choice between United Ireland or status quo, shaky or unclear as that looks at the moment. Is there a third option? Yeah, uh, I mean, some people are talking about and in many ways, this is, this is how I think a united Ireland will occur. <laughs> um, uh, I mean, if you're talking about a united Ireland, what is it actually going to look like? A united Ireland will mean, and people are talking about this at the moment, even some of the more uh, extreme DUP types are saying, well, what, 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 this, what, what are you talking about, this united Ireland? And then people say, and then some of the uh, Sinn Féin types are going, yeah, what do we mean? Uh, so it basically means that the Northern Ireland Assembly will continue to meet. There'll be a meeting of the Southern Irish government. So who funds basically what happens within the Northern Irish Assembly? So it's basically a question of, first of all, a question of funding and handling things. And there's also the thing of like, the Southern Irish government really doesn't want to take on a united Ireland in a full scale sense of the term. Like they don't want to take on 1 million angry Protestants. Like that's, that's not something you want to vote for. So they will give as much latitude as possible uh, to any degree of uh, federalism, if you like, that is demanded by Northerners. So 
what you have at the present is sort of what it's basically a question of funding uh, is, is, is what's happening. And at the moment, the British government is funding it. I think it'll continue to fund it for the, because they'll have to fund it for a long time, even if it's not necessarily theirs. But uh, nonetheless, uh, that will be the situation into the future. But it, it's possible that you could have a Northern Irish government separate from, separate from everything else, but six counties that is practically the size of Sydney. No, not really. One one point eight million people. No. We have a question from Isabella Barker. What are the chances that a paramilitary will start up again in Ireland given the circumstances? Okay, this is what I think might happen. And it's sort of, this, uh, these are sort of things that occur to me when it's three o'clock in the night when I have to go to the toilet. Uh, uh, the, uh, it's, it's the same thing that happened to the uh, IRA in 1969, the IRA basically had laid down its weapons and it had taken up peaceful forms of protest. And it basically said, let's get out and march for civil rights. What has the provisional IRA done? It's gone, okay, we agree with this peace process. We give you our weapons. But what happened to the IRA when the Protestants started attacking their areas? and started throwing petrol bombs through their windows. And when they were driven out of the, driven out of familiar areas within um, Belfast, uh, such as Cooper Street and so on and so forth, thing was written at, on walls at, the, at that particular time, IRA equals I ran away. So people there were very critical of the IRA. I can imagine that the current Sinn Féin will face, just imagine a violent future, similar sorts of criticism from the Catholic population that may, just may, become attacked by uh, Protestant paramilitaries. This will lead to the rise of dissident groups that will be armed and they will take over their role and they will be called the new IRA or the uh, blah, blah IRA. You know, it's all the different forms of IRA. One comedian uh, joked about it and used to say, you have all these different IRAs, might as well talk about the, the decaf IRA. There's so many different types of IRA that we have at the moment. But nonetheless, this is the, ways in which um, uh, the, the, the prov Sinn Féin has now put itself into a situation where it was formerly a, uh, an armed group is now essentially a, a political group. And it may find itself during a state of unionist violence with no uh, nothing to do in terms of an armed response. And therefore you will have a different group taking, uh, taking up arms as a result. That's a very long answer, but nonetheless, I can see. Okay, we have a, a question from Alona. Um, do you think Northern Ireland has an appetite to join EU regardless of the time frame? How will their trade cope not being part of the EU? Sorry, could you say that again? Uh, do you think Northern Ireland has an appetite to join the EU, regardless of the time frame? Yeah. And how will their trade cope during the period of time they're not part of the EU? Northern Ireland is part of the EU. I mean, that's what the Northern Irish Protocol basically states. It's an effective member of the EU to all extents and purposes. This is the way in which the Northern Irish Protocol works. But that upsets the unionists 
because even though a majority within Northern Ireland voted against Brexit, there's now this feeling, now, to, now we're going with the EU, Britain is going towards Brexit, now we're heading in this direction, Britain's had, now we have a sea, you know, there's all these difference. So, and they can see that the trade that exists between the North and the South of Ireland has taken off exponentially as a result of the uh, Northern Ireland Protocol. So this uh, leads to a lot of uh, nightmares, let's say, within the unionist community. But anyway, to answer that particular question, it is a member of the, to all extension purposes of the, uh, of the EU. And that's good for its economy. That's, that's that's good for its economy, but more importantly, it saves uh, it it's it it saves the the Good Friday Agreement. We've got time for one last question. So for Matthew Coot. Uh, I believe that the Irish uh, Republican and North Northern Irish cricket team and rugby team play under the one banner these days. Do you believe this form of soft diplomacy has influenced the possibility of a united Ireland? <laughs> I'd like to think so. Uh, the real question is, would, Northern, would Ireland ever have a uh, unified uh, soccer team? And the answer is no. And that tells you a lot because everybody follows soccer. Uh, nobody pays that much attention to either uh, rugby or cricket. So uh, just the middle class. So essentially uh, it's, it's, it's that working class sport, uh, soccer and the the following of of soccer if if the if if the if those if, if if you had a situation whereby people turned around and said hey let's have an all ireland uh soccer team then i'd be then i'd say okay now we're moving towards a united ireland but cricket really at the time nobody cared that much rugby the same because they really didn't matter. Because very few people played either of them. Well, it's great to hear that there's something about Ireland that doesn't matter. <laughs> I'm reminded of a remark made to us here by a speaker on the Middle East some years ago. He said, now, if you understand the Middle East, it hasn't properly been explained to you. <laughs> I think tonight you've taken us some way towards understanding yeah, our, our oh, British, yeah. tough situation. Can I just mention that next week uh, will be one of our off weeks and under the COVID arrangements. We're now having our live and Zoom events every second week, roughly, and in the intervening weeks, putting out our newsletter. Our, our newsletter will go out next week, columns from Glover Cottages. Then the following week, which is the 29th of June, Tuesday the 29th, we'll be having our interns presentation, five topics, five international topics chosen by them. So we'll welcome you on that occasion. Now, to finish tonight, one of our interns, Rachel Bell McDonald, will move a vote of thanks to Dr. Maguire. On behalf of the Australian Institute of International Affairs, New South Wales, I would like to thank Dr. Maguire for taking the time this evening to talk about Northern Ireland after Brexit. Dr. Maguire has made it very clear how critical the Good Friday Agreement is to the peace on the island of Ireland. Good Friday Agreement has been a process between not just the UK and Irish governments, but also the US and EU, who act as guarantors and facilitators of peace. In light of the UK government's apparent willingness to undermine the Northern Ireland Protocol, these same actors are now involved once again, as we, as we have seen in recent days at the G7 summit. But beyond diplomatic squabbles and diplomatic notes is the fact that Brexit represents an, an existential threat to Northern Ireland. As Dr. McGuire so aptly said, the Brexit referendum and Good Friday Agreement were fundamentally antithetical in nature, 
And so Brexit lies at the center of the deeply troubling prospect of violence in Northern Ireland after 23 years. Let us hope that the many actors who played a part in the Good Friday, in the Good Friday Agreement over two decades ago can now uphold its integrity. Thank you also to those who joined in for the questions and answers this evening. Questions focused on the prospect of Scottish and Northern Irish independence, the Labour Party's stance or lack of on the Northern Ireland Protocol, and even cricket and rugby teams. <laughs> Providing a forum for discussion and debate is central to what AIIA does, and it is in part thanks to the audience, audience's contributions tonight that we were able to do this. Once again, let us extend our thanks to Dr Maguire for what has been an insightful discussion on a complex issue. Have a wonderful rest of the evening.